next speaker is Simon Wilson from Trinity College Dublin. Uh, we're in computer science and statistics. He's interested in applying uh, basic methods of statistics conference to a variety of applications in science engineering and learning humanities, and in particular the reliability and the communication, uh, astronomy, and ecology. And today, uh, Simon is going to talk about sequential based parameter estimation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, just as I uh, listened to the talks in the meeting, uh, I realized I may be somewhat of an outlier. Um, my background is uh, in a statistics department which was merged some years ago with a bunch of computer scientists um, and uh, suddenly was exposed to wonderful and weird things such as um, graphical processing units and uh, proper ways to write computer code and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, my main interests are in uh, Bayesian inference, uh, and of course in Bayesian inference you certainly have lots of computational issues that uh, um, are shared with machine learning. Um, this talk is looking at um, um, uh, estimation in state safe models or, or hidden Markov models, uh, and um, of course, Bayesian inference has a nice, um, uh, you know, the state law is sequential in nature, which makes it a, a, you know, a very appropriate way to do inference in, 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 a, in a screaming setting, in a sequential setting. Um, so this is the sort of model that I'm interested in, because these models are um, here in lots of places. Um, um, and it's seen lots of applications. You have a you have a latent observed process which is Markovian, uh, and you observe noisy realizations of that process. Uh, these are independent given the unobserved uh, process settings. Uh, so the model is specified by an observation distribution of y given x's um, <coughs> starting state for the unobserved process, and then the Markov state. So how the how the unobserved process proceeds in time. Uh, and then if you're trying to do Bayesian uh, learning on this model, you might want to prior on the parameters theta, which parameterizes this, uh, this model. Now, what are the, the usual tasks, uh, inference tasks for such models? So uh, I would contend that the first and the third one here are, are the most common. Um, the, the parameters of the model are usually fixed to some appropriate value, deemed appropriate, and you're interested in the, in the filtering so learning about the unobserved process given data, and you might also be interested in predictions of what the, either the observed or other process going to do next um, given data. Um, now, in this work, we want to do these tasks um, sequentially and quickly. So uh, we we assume you know, we've solved these problems at time t minus one. Uh, we observe a new data in y t, and we want to update our state of um, knowledge uh, to that new time. And somewhat unusually for this field, uh, we're actually going to concentrate on the estimation problem, the second problem here. Um, so uh, what can we learn about these parameters uh, in light of data, and how can we update our knowledge sequentially as the data comes at us? Uh, as I said, most of the literature in, in, in this area will tend to um, just assume these parameters are known uh, or do some pre-processing that, that gets a, a reasonable value for them. Um, so uh, in that situation. Okay, there's two, um, again, okay, simple manipulation of probability laws will give you two potentially useful uh, results uh, for these models. So um, the first is you can write the, the posterior distribution of theta given data uh, up to a constant uh, like this. Okay, so it's Multiplication or probability a couple of times. Um, and this is valid for any x where the denominator is non zero. Um, here's another, perhaps slightly more useful um, uh, updating equation. Uh, this allows you to go from time t minus 1 to time t uh, by way of calculating this expression in red. Okay. Again, at any value now of xt for which the denominator. Um, and we'll also observe that for many hidden Markov models, many useful hidden Markov models, um, the dimension of theta is small enough so that you can actually just grid it. So you, can, you, can, you can define a discrete grid on values of theta um, uh, and 
so one can calculate this on an order of degree three, which will just result in the Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. Um, so that's where I was sort of starting off uh, this one. Um, so again, in terms of thinking about you know, data streaming out at a high rate, this is not very appealing. Uh, it requires us to work with distributions of dimension C. Uh, this one is more appealing. The, um, the the new thing we have to evaluate at any time is this dimension one, which would be the expression for dimension one. So um, that's certainly more appealing. Um, uh, updating equation, and also note that um, if we have solved the filtering and prediction problem, so these two distributions here, uh, then we can evaluate this updating. So, so what that means is if we can solve the filtering and prediction problem, we can update sequentially uh, our distribution of the parameters theta. Okay, uh, the typical choice um, here for the for the X, uh, we usually choose typically would pick X that maximizes this probability on the denominator for numerical stability reasons. Um, but one could choose any X. Um, all these all these formulae are up to constant proportionality, but again, assuming that theta is of low dimension, the normalizing constant is very easy to compute because just the sum over the theta of the grid, the discrete grid. Uh, so we have that anyway. um, to show you an example of a method that used the former rather than the latter updating equation, um, and that that's not a very good idea, uh, I've taken here a very successful. Um, Approximation for the parameters of a, of a, of a uh, hidden Markov model um, of, of any, hidden, um, any hidden model. Um, uh, this is something called the integrated nested Laplace approximation, and it uses a, it uses this updating, it uses this identity where an approximation to the uh, filtering density, the Gaussian approximation, is done to the denominator. Um, and this turns out to be a very accurate and very fast approximation, particularly if the Markov process is itself Gaussian. Um, so it turns out to be very accurate. Um, it basically beats things like Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, in terms of both speed and accuracy very, very easily. Um, because we try to use this method for sequential updating. Um, uh, it turns out not to be a very good approach. Um, the essentially the, the the updating term we'd have to use it each time would be a ratio of um, Gaussian approximations of order of dimension c. So okay, so it's not going to work very very nicely if we get more, more data. Um, we have tried, and we'll see later. Um, we've tried to approximate this term further by a uh, the Gaussian term. Um, we call this a crude approximation. So this would be now quick, but as you see, not very good. Um, okay, things that do work for um, for this are where you have some approximation to the filtering and uh, prediction density. So this would typically be the case for lots of um, these methods. So um, things like common filter based methods uh, would try and produce approximations. And look, if we have those, then we can um, we can do our updating. So at time t minus one, if we have some approximation to this distribution, uh, we can produce an approximation of time t by uh, by using this to approximation c. Okay. So this is nice because now we can use any any method that produces these approximations. We can we can use and see how it does. Um, so we've tried lots of different approaches and, and try them out on a lot of different models to see how well they perform. Um, so the, the simplest um, would be to use a carbon filter to approximate these two densities. So of course that's exact if uh, our um, uh, model is linear and Gaussian. Uh, as soon as you step away from either of these, uh, we're getting into um, approximate methods. Two that are very common are the extended carbon filter, which is uh, the extended carbon filter tries to cope with nonlinear models by 
uh, essentially linearizing them and turning them into the Kalman filter. Uh, the uncentered Kalman filter uh, tries to do something similar by um, trying to account for how the mean invariance um, of um, x change um, according to the nonlinear part of the model. Um, so both are quite successful, and we can use those in this approximation. And both of them, um, you get out a, a mean of the predominated term here, which you can use for x. Um, another issue with these um, sort of dynamically updating what you've learned about theta, um, uh, in, in this case, is we have, a, we have a grid of values over which we compute this, and of course that grid may change with time. So um, we've tried various methods for uh, dynamically updating the grid, so one might imagine that um, you know, as time goes on, uh, what you've learned about theta may change, the, both in terms of scale and location. Um, we tried lots of quite sophisticated, well, what we thought were quite sophisticated ways of, of updating the grid, and in the end, what actually seemed to work best was something very fast and simple, where uh, we simply detected whether uh, the existing grid was um, um, uh, not big enough or too big by looking at what's happening at the edges of the, of the grid. And then, um, if we had to add new points externally, we simply did some linear interpolation. And if we had to add new points internally, again, we just resorted to linear interpolation. Uh, the point here being that if you add new points to your grid, um, you don't have time to go back and recompute the entire approximation up to that point uh, at, at the added point. Uh, you just have to, again, do some approximation. And again, we were quite um, pleasantly surprised that this is remarkably stable. Um, um, uh, even though this is an approximation to an approximation. Um, so this is this is our algorithm for, for learning about theta. Um, what we do initially is we use this um, integration f plus plus approximation to get our uh, to get our approximation to the posterior, and we do that because it's very accurate, and we do it for as long as we can. So we do it up to a point to a observation t y t, such that this is just becoming too slow a computation to do. <coughs> And from then on, we do our sequential update, like this, where the filtering and prediction density is coming from um, some, perhaps, common filter, perhaps other um, algorithm that's, that's output. And then periodically, we check to see if the grid of values of theta over which we're computing this um, is either too big or too small or needs shifting in location, and we add delete acceptor points uh, and interpolate the values of new points uh, appropriately. Um, okay, so um, a couple of examples. Um, so the first is a linear Gaussian. So if we can't get this right, then we might as well go home. Um, now remember this crude approximation using um, INLA, um, uh, it works really badly. So okay, we'll say nothing more about that. Um, of course, if we use the Kalman filter, um, we, we have an exact algorithm, so not surprisingly, it gets the right result. So uh, the way to read these uh, graphs is here are the three parameters of the, of the linear model. Uh, the black line is the true value, x-axis is observation time, and the red is posterior mode, and blue is a 95% marginal posterior interval. So of course, you see all the time, uh, we, okay, we nailed it. True values are found quite nicely, and the uncertainty is, of course, going down as we observe more data. Um, if we compare this method to some other um, parameter estimation methods, like a, um, like a particle filter, um, we can do some comparison in various ways, but it's probably the best spot to look at. This is sort of the trade off between uh, accuracy of the approximation. Uh, and computation time, so computation time is on the y-axis. Uh, this is log Mahalanobis distance between the posterior, the computed posterior and uh, the true value of the parameter. Uh, so you want to be down in the bottom left corner, that would be fast and accurate. Um, uh, our method is considerably faster than a particle filter, which you'd expect because it's not doing Monte Carlo uh, simulation. 
uh, and it's sort of similar in terms of accuracy. So it's doing better than that. Okay. So here's a nonlinear model. Okay, so the um, uh, it's basically periodicity to the um, to the inoculant process, and the observations are this, uh, roughly the square of the uh, of the inoculant process. Again, there are four parameters in this model, uh, and our method does quite well, uh, except on one parameter uh, where it doesn't do very well at all. Uh, although we couldn't actually get any other method we tried to work well. And again, if you look at the comparison of um, computing <coughs> posterior, posterior to posterior by, um, say, a particle filter, um, again, we just look at this graph. Uh, our method here in red and black uh, is um, generally actually more accurate and faster than a particle filter in this case. So it's better. <coughs> and then finally, a non Gaussian model. So here, the observation equation is Poisson, so the y that counts. Um, uh, and the unobserved process is just a, an autoregressive model. Um, now, um, to implement this for um, our method, we actually approximate the observation equation by a, by a Gaussian. So, I mean, for x sufficient, if x is sufficiently large, you, know, you can approximate a on by a Gaussian. Um, and again, how does that method do? It does very well, again, even with this Gaussian approximation, um, um, we managed to nail the, uh, the true value of the parameters. Uh, and then, again, over many runs, um, when we compare our technique to a something like a particle filter, uh, again, concentration on this graph, uh, the red and the black are our methods, so they're faster than particle <laughs> filters, uh, but tend to be a little less accurate. So. Uh, so here there is that trade-off between computation time and accuracy. The nice thing about our method is that it doesn't slow down the time, so you know, the, the, the method is not getting slower as, as, as this was with the data. And a couple of remarks. Um, so first of all, the, the method is in some sense trivially parallelizable, at least over the grid of values of theta. Of course, <laughs> calculations are done completely independently. Um, um, it's easy then of to average out um, over the posterior theta to get marginal filtering and prediction, so taking account of the uncertainty in the parameters. This is of course a major restriction, so the, essentially the set of static parameters theta in the model must be small enough so you can grid it up, so um, you know, anything beyond six or seven um, parameters, uh, you know, your grid is starting to get um, there's lots of work on corrections to um, things like UTF and ETF uh, filtering and, and, um, and prediction approximations. So what we've tried is this very nice paper appeared a few years ago in, in, in um, JMLR, um, and these approximations work very nicely and really improve uh, improve the accuracy of the any of the models that we've looked at. Um, this is a nice question, sort of how you dynamically update this grid over which you're computing the posterior. So um, probably do a better job there of <coughs> dynamically upgrading it. We've done something very um, uh, very crude. It appears to work for these rather straightforward low dimensional models, uh, but you could probably do something better there. So obviously these are all sort of things that one might might now to look at. Um, particular um, spatiotemporal data is um, an interesting one. There's lots of it, and of course it's, it's less amenable to um, uh, particularly parallelization uh, because you, you know, you're taking account of spatial correlation. That's a really important thing. So, um, so we certainly have lots of. of Applications where where we're interested in applying applying to this sort of data, and it's, it's not so obvious that, uh, how we might do it. Going beyond a set of uh, demand dimension of theta that, that you can simply grid up, 
uh, there are various things one might do there which would be useful. Um, and then, of course, this whole idea of getting a grid, a dynamic of getting a grid. Um, uh, but some work on this, but not very much. And that's something we'd also like to, to think about. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much.